First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Gainesville commissioners are considering a plan to manage the homeless camp near Grace Marketplace, known as Dignity Village. Good evening, it's Tuesday, June 2nd. I'm Molly Robinson. And I'm Marie Edinger. Thanks for joining us. Last month, they discussed a report about that homeless community and discovered that several sex offenders and sex predators live there. Samantha Sosa joins us now in the studio to tell us about how people living there feel about that sex offender population and what the Gainesville Police Department is trying to do about it. Well, ladies, there is a lot of concern about this because there are children living in Dignity Village among the adults. As of right now, Dignity Village isn't constantly watched, but police officers say that may change soon. I can blow him up for you. <laughs> Since Dignity Village appeared, it hasn't been uncommon to see predators and offenders come and go. Today, 15 were found registered living in the area. I probably see a one to two a week uh, that are moving into Dignity Village. But with the growing population and recent violence in the area, people who live there are worried, especially since there are children living there for long periods of time. Uh, the most we had was like four at one time. And uh, they, you know, stayed a while until they got into housing. Even though children do live there, the predators are allowed to stay according to Florida law. Sexual predators can't live within a thousand feet of a child care facility, of a school or a church or anywhere where uh, children would normally congregate. And so Dignity Village does not fall into one of those special places in the Florida law. GPD plans to increase patrol there. Consider the placement of a two person cop team. Chief Tony Jones uh, asked the city there. to add two extra officers to their full time staff to patrol the area 24 hours a day. A big relief to those living there. That could cost the city as much as $150,000 every year. They don't stop. They don't stop. And more police presence would be a good thing. GPD sends out notices every time a predator or offender starts living there. Until a police team is staffed, residents will continue looking out for each other. You shouldn't be around little kids, you know. So I'm watching. <laughs> yeah. Plans to manage Dignity Village are still being made. A plan will be presented to the City Commission in July. Thanks, Samantha. Now, we did get hit pretty hard yesterday in Gainesville with all that rain. That's right. There are even some reports of golf ball-sized hail in Gainesville. UF forecaster Rebecca Kobelman is in the Weather Center tracking more of those storms right now. Rebecca, when will we see some relief? Molly Marie, luckily Gainesville was spared today from the strong thunderstorm activity, but there could still be some thunderstorms and some showers in the area late tonight, even lingering past the midnight hour this evening. But right now on storm track radar, just a tiny cell just to the north of Gainesville. But what I'm tracking is this cell in extreme western Le or eastern Levy County that is moving into Marion County and could be impacting Ocala within the next hour, but it is moving very slowly and will continue to produce some heavy rainfall. And that's the real concern because some areas yesterday received three to four inches of rain and also along the I-95 corridor. That's where the Atlantic Sea Breeze has been near St. Augustine and Crescent Beach for this evening. But the culprit is a complex in the Gulf that is moving onshore and it's continuing to push to the east and that could bring some rain chances in the overnight hours tonight and lead to some rainy conditions in the overnight hours. I'll track more of that for you. My main weather forecast back to you. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, the Panama City Police have finished their investigation into the actions of UF's chapter of Zeta Beta Tau. The investigation concluded that members of the fraternity did, in fact, act inappropriately. Members were accused of assaulting veterans on a retreat earlier this year, but Panama City investigators say that because the members of the fraternity did not cooperate with the investigation, they were not able to identify any members to charge. And concerns about an annual commemoration event have prompted some of Gainesville's residents to speak out against the expansion of Northwest 8th Avenue. The controversial road has made news before for being too narrow. But now with plans to expand, some residents think the road is fine the way it is. WUFT's Jonathan Munoz joins us now live in the newsroom. Jonathan, what are the residents' main concerns? Well, the main concern deals with an annual event put together by a local veterans group where they use the side of the road to remember those who have died in combat. There has been a lot of debate about the configuration of Northwest 8th Avenue. 
And after much debate, the road will be changing to better accommodate cyclists and pedestrians. But with that change comes a loss of space along the side of the road where a very special event takes place every year on Memorial Day. Just for Peace has a wonderful organization to setting up these two tombstones that, and they're chronologically laid out to recognize those who have been killed in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And that prompted Elliot to write an email to the city commission voicing her concerns to save what's been dubbed Memorial Mile. I do think that we as a nation should be honoring their sacrifice. Drive down Northwest 8th Avenue on Memorial Day and you'll see a lot more than just the planets. You'll see cardboard tombstones meant to commemorate those that have lost their lives in the armed forces. And while there's some concern that this may have been the final year, a new location may be available starting next year. We've talked about uh, finding accommodations on, at Depot Park, along the trail, uh, other places where we can continue to have them you know, do that. And Elliot thinks this alternative may just work. I think it might provide more walkability uh, in terms of people being able to really reflect on, um, you know, the sacrifice. Chase isn't sure how far along construction of the road will be by next Memorial Day, but points out there will be other places to honor those soldiers. Reporting live in the newsroom, Jonathan Munoz, WUFT News. Thank you, Jonathan. Two women have been arrested and accused of making fake returns to the Burlington Coat Factory. Gainesville police officers were called out to the store when employees say they saw Jessica Schiametta shoplifting. According to the police report, it was soon revealed that she and Rebecca Parks were making fake returns to the store in exchange for almost $1,000 in gift cards. Investigators say those gift cards were pawned off for cash. They say Parks even admitted that the two had done this multiple times at different stores throughout the county. And the search is on for two men suspected of robbing workers at an Ocala store at gunpoint. The robbery took place this morning at the Dollar General off 10th Street. Witnesses say the robbers are two black teenagers. One was wearing a red-orange long-sleeve shirt and the other a dark-colored hoodie with white stripes. No one was harmed in the robbery, but two teens got away with some money. Anyone with information is encouraged to contact Crime Stoppers of Marion County. Alachua County is applying for a $10 million federal grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation to reconstruct Tower Road. The project is estimated to cost about $12.5 million. If the grant is received, Alachua County plans to contribute the extra $2.5 million from impact fees and other local sources. Alachua County has been working on redeveloping Tower Road since the late 90s. Planners are hoping to finally obtain the funds for the overdue renovation. The county is applying for Tower Road to resurface Tower Road um, to add some turn lanes where they're needed um, to add bicycle lanes. There's currently no shoulders or bicycle lanes on Tower Road um, to complete the sidewalk network where it's incomplete and to improve the transit stops and ADA access along the corridor. If approved, the county expects 18 months of engineer planning and 18 months of construction. They expect an answer about the funding in a couple of months. The estimated finish date is in late 2018. Friends and family of a Florida man are demanding justice. A man ended up on life support Friday following an eight minute drive from the courthouse to the Indian River County Jail. This video from the sheriff's office shows Brad Martinez in street clothes getting into a transport van. Martinez was in a holding area by himself directly behind the driver. During the eight minute ride, something happened where Martinez needed immediate medical attention when the van arrived at the jail. And the sheriff says they're in the process of interviewing everyone who was in the transport van at the time. Martinez remains in critical condition. A Miami high schooler gets a special graduation present, her father. Sergeant Jose Garcia appeared in person to see his daughter pick up her diploma from Miami Killian Senior High. The last time the two saw each other was when Samantha was a freshman. Sergeant Garcia has served numerous deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan and has only been able to return home twice over the last eight years. WUFT News First at Five is just getting started. Coming up, the president of FIFA resigns. This comes amid a corruption scandal in the soccer organization. More on that after the break. Plus, the fight continues on Capitol Hill over the Patriot Act. The Senate is still working on a compromise. Those stories and more coming up after the break. We'll be right back. You're watching WUFT-TV News.
Welcome back. FIFA President Sepp Blatter is stepping down as head of World Soccer's governing body. The news came as a surprise because Blatter was just re-elected to a fifth presidential term on Friday. Blatter's departure comes amid a U.S. Justice Department investigation of FIFA, where 14 people are charged with racketeering, wire fraud, and money laundering conspiracy. Speaking in Zurich, Blatter said that he thinks the organization needs a profound restructuring. Although the members of FIFA have given me the new mandate, have elected, re-elected me president, this mandate does not seem to be supported by everybody in the world of football. Blatter says he'll continue his duties until a new president is elected. He wants that vote to take place as soon as possible and before the next World Congress in May 2016. And since it's Tuesday, that means it's time to turn our eyes to the real-life House of Cards. That's right, and we have our very own Danny Matthew joining us in the studio with the latest political news. Danny, who's currently eyeing the White House? Well, ladies, it looks like another former governor has announced his bid for the Oval Office, but first let's talk about the fight over the Patriot Act. Today, the National Security Agency can no longer collect America's phone records in bulk. The Senate failed to extend the highly controversial program and instead is considering the USA Freedom Act. Passed by the House earlier this month, that bill transfers the authority to collect bulk telephone data from the government to telecom companies, which would hold on to it in case the subpoena is issued. Opponents, including Republican presidential candidate Rand Paul, cite concerns over the government's access to the data. He moved to delay a final vote on the USA Freedom Act for a few days. That action angered some fellow Republicans who walked out as he stood to speak. But today, that bill has passed both chambers and is currently awaiting the president's approval. Dennis Hastert has resigned from his position on the board of advisors at Illinois' Wheaton College. This comes amid allegations that he engaged in misconduct with a student during his years as a high school teacher and wrestling coach. The former House Speaker is an alumnus of Wheaton College, where he sat on the board of advisors at the J. Dennis Hazard Center for Economics, Government, and Public Policy. A statement released by the college said that the respect Hassert's public pu service records and the due process being afforded him in his recent indictment Thursday, Hassert was indicted on federal charges that structured a bank withdrawal on nearly $1 million in a way that would evade the required reporting of transactions over $10,000. Officials say Hassert had agreed to pay $3.5 million to an undisclosed person from Yorkville, Illinois, to conceal past misconduct. The indictment strongly suggests that the misconduct happened while Hassert was a teacher in Yorkville. The investigation into Hassert's allegations misconduct is ongoing. Former, Mar former Governor Martin O'Malley has announced he's seeking the Democratic nomination for president. Hundreds of people came out for the announcement at Federal Hill in Baltimore. O'Malley served two terms as Maryland's governor and prior to that was the mayor of Baltimore. He describes himself as a liberal crusader and said climate change, immigration, reform, and taking on special interests are prime issues of his candidacy. We are a nation of immigrants. We are a compassionate and generous people. And if we act according to our principles and the better angels of our nature, if we return, in other words, to our true selves, the dream will live again. O'Malley also took a shot at his Democratic rival, mentioning that the CEO of Goldman Sachs said he'd be fine with either Jeb Bush or Hillary Clinton as president. The location is Florida this time, in another event that is bringing Republican presidential hopefuls to one place to pitch themselves to activists. Republican Florida Governor Rick Scott is hosting what is billed as an economic summit, and at least eight announced or likely GOP hopefuls are speaking at the event. Florida, of course, is a major electoral prize and is likely to hold a mid-March primary where the winner would take all of the state's delegates. Sunshine State natives Jeb Bush and Senator Marco Rubio would presumably have an inside track to win the state. But that didn't stop either GOP notables today from making the case. When we have used every option that is available, we need to respond in an incredibly powerful way where there is no doubt that when America, cross, when America puts a red line and you cross that red line, there will be a consequence to pay. Rubio was also scheduled to speak today, but Senate votes in Washington prevented him from appearing in person. Well, ladies, it seems like the Supreme Court is overturning the case made against a Pennsylvania man and his threatening Facebook statuses. 
he will be charged on intent as opposed to perception, which was what he was originally charged on. It seems like we've just been seeing so many cases lately with people getting in trouble for what they post on Facebook. Yeah, that definitely seems to be a rising trend, especially with social media growing so popular. Especially job recruiters now even use, you know, people's digital footprints to determine whether or not you get a job. So that's very important. Thank you, Danny. And today isn't looking quite as stormy as yesterday did. Not quite, but Rebecca is still tracking some storms in other counties. Rebecca, will there be any rain for the rest of the week? Molly Marie, the trend started today with less coverage and intensity of the storms, and that in fact will be continuing for the rest of the week. But right now, there are still some cells out there on Storm Track Radar. Luckily, not much in Gainesville and Ocala. I'll track these storms and let you know when rain chances go down after the break. Unlike yesterday, the atmosphere spared Gainesville of some strong thunderstorms, but other areas in North Florida were not quite as lucky. Welcome back. I'm UF forecaster Rebecca Kopelman. And right now, still a few cells out on storm track radar and Gainesville not completely in the clear for the overnight hours. But right now, a cell developing just to the north of Gainesville, approaching Alachua and the I-75 corridor for this evening. Further south towards Ocala, there's another cell just south of Williston moving very slowly though that could approach the city within the next hour still producing some heavy rain and lightning and heavy rain really our main concern especially in those areas that got hit very hard yesterday in the past couple of days but Gainesville not much rain but the clouds it wasn't a very pretty day and today's high only 83 degrees so we are a bit more stable today compared to yesterday when on campus we, we hit 95 degrees before that severe storm moved through the area but the culprit today is this complex in the Gulf it's a very broad area of low pressure that brought some showers on shore and the clouds all day long helped keep most of North Florida stable, but a few showers and storms started to kick up. Most of the convection, though, did stay in portions of central and south Florida. But because of all the moisture overhead, can't rule out some sh some spotty showers and thunderstorms later on this evening close to the city of Gainesville and east of I-75. And not just that, but overnight after the sun sets, there could still be a few light showers in the area, mainly for our southern zones in portions of Marion County and Ocala, even through possibly the 3 a.m. hour. But then we'll start to dry out and just partly cloudy conditions in the overnight hours. Still muggy, though. Temperatures will drop to the upper 60s, 67 in Gainesville, 64 in Lake City, and 67 for that low in Ocala. Tomorrow, a bit more sunshine, but that trend of lower rain chances that started today is going to continue into tomorrow. Spotty activity across the area by 2 o'clock, and then later on, I think the sea breezes may meet up just to the west of the I-75 corridor a bit later in the evening, and most of it will stay to the west, but can't rule out a few showers and storms closer to the city of Gainesville and Ocala, and that will continue to push off throughout the evening hours, but much less in coverage compared to the past couple of days. That's going to continue as well because all of the moisture is really going to stay to our south and to our east. This all this tropical moisture, check it out, staying in South Florida over the next couple of days. And in fact, as I zoom in here on Friday, you can see some brown areas and they're indicating some drier air that will continue into this weekend. So your six day forecast, not looking too bad. Low rain chances continue all the way through this weekend. Temperatures start to slowly approach that 90 degree mark. You can always get the latest at ufweather.org. Back to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Tonight is game two of the Women's College World Series. Our sports anchor, Jonathan Perez, has more. That's right. The Gators are looking to repeat as national champions. And with more, we take you to Oklahoma City for a live update with Nico Tan. Yeah, guys, the Gators have a chance to add another national championship to their trophy case with a win tonight. When we come back, I'll have a preview of the game and more sports is next. Gator softball team snapped Michigan's 28 game winning streak last night. Now Florida needs just one more win to repeat as national champs. Welcome back to sports. I'm Jonathan Perez. We have our WUFB, WUFT softball beat reporter Nico Tan out in Oklahoma City covering the team. Nico, what should we expect for tonight? 
Well, Jonathan, the Gators are looking to follow UCLA and Arizona as the only teams to win back-to-back -back national championships in softball. And let me tell you, the Gators are feeling really good right now. Many people expect this senior, Lauren Hager, to get the start in the circle last night, but that was not the case. Freshman pitcher Alicia Ocasio held down the fort for six innings before sophomore Delaney Gorley shut the door for the save. Florida head coach Tim Walton said after the game that he's happy to have such a deep pitching staff. You've got to you got to deal with uh, the personalities a little bit, you know, because each each one of these three up here could be a number one pitcher um, at a lot of places, and um, you know each one of these pitchers have been a number one pitcher probably even through this season, you know, to give you to be honest with you. Nico, uh, I said uh, you said Ocasio start got the start yesterday. Who do you expect to start tonight? Well, Jonathan, I fully expect senior Lauren Hager to get the start in the circle tonight. And let me put it this way: the Gators are in the situation where they just need. One more win to secure the national championship. So I would think the coaching staff would trust their senior, their national player of the year, Lauren Hager, to get the job done and bring home the bacon. First pitch is scheduled for 8 p.m. Reporting live from Oklahoma City, Nico Tan, WFT Sports. All right, thank you, Nico. The Florida Gator baseball team finally knows their opponent for the Gainesville Super Regional this weekend, and it's none other, none other than in-state rival Florida State. The Seminoles defeated College of Charleston 8-1 yesterday to secure a dugout at McKeithen Stadium to face the Gators. The Florida and the Knolls met each other three times during the regular season, and the Seminoles claimed the Sunshine Showdown by winning the last two games of the series. Florida did, however, grab the first game at Gainesville, where they exploded for 14 runs as they downed the Knolls 14-8. The Gators and the Seminoles will start the best of three series on Friday, starting at 7.30. There were still lots of regional games taking place last night to determine which team would advance to the Super Regional, but today the Super Regional bracket is completed. In the SEC alone, there are five teams that punch their ticket to the Super Regionals. LSU will take on Lafayette, the Aggies will face TCU, and Vandy will play Illinois. On the other side of the bracket, Arkansas will play Missouri State, and in-state rival the Miami Hurricanes will face VCU. Over in the major leagues, the Rays trying to extend their winning streak to three games last night in Anaheim against the Angels. Rays pitcher Alex Colome not having the best of starts. He already gave up a solo home run in the second, and then in the third inning, he gives up another home run this time, a three-run shot from Mike Trout. The long ball continues to haunt Colome as Albert Pujols clobbers this one to left field for the solo blast in the fifth inning. Pujols would homer again in the eighth as the Angels crush four homers on the night to beat the Rays seven to three. Tonight, Tampa's Chris, Ar Chris Archer will start the game for game two. One last, act, one last look at the weather forecast after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Just wanted to update you on radar. Still a few cells in Alachua County, and this cell strengthening just to the west of Ocala will approach the city within the next 30 minutes and could produce some frequent lightning and some heavy rainfall. Some cells also along the I-95 corridor and there could be some cells close to I-75 through about 10 o'clock this evening. Lower rain chances though starting tomorrow mainly after 2 o'clock and near and west of I-75. Back to you. Thanks Rebecca and thank you at home for watching WUFT News First at 5. We'll see you again tomorrow but you can always get more news at WUFT.org. Here on WUFT TV, BBC World News is up next, and the PBS News Hour is coming up at 7 o'clock. Good night.